So greetings, Zoe. What I'm going to give us a chance to do is be here for the wake-up call. When we give this talk over at Canyon Ranch, and the wake-up call is that opportunity to take a step back and to think about when we talk about wellness, when we talk about that of prevention, when we talk about optimal health, we always need to be talking about nutrition, need to be talking about exercise. But sleep is that one component that is usually an afterthought. So we're going to be talking about this from a wellness standpoint, but obviously because of the topic of the day, the inflammation construct as well. No disclosures for me to note, and what are we going to be focusing on? Number one, presenting this as a key measure for optimal health. We're going to review the function of sleep, as we always um, sometimes think we know what we're um, looking at with sleep, but there's many things going on underneath the discussion. Also, to illustrate the connection between poor sleep leading to inflammation, inflammation leading to poor sleep. Now, many of these talks can simply be um, speaking solely on the topic of sleep apnea. But when we were only looking at apnea, what I want us to understand is that not all apnea is textbook stuff. If we're waiting for the most obvious cases, we're going to miss a vast majority of it. Furthermore, a topic that does not get enough popular press is that one related to insomnia. Insomnia, as we're going to talk about, is also highly um, correlated with morbidity and possibly also with an inflammation connection. So please, let's make sure we keep note of that because that is going to be a common, probably the most common conundrum that you'll come up against. And then always, because sleep is one of those newer discussions, sleep medicine is new in the sense that the American Academy of Sleep Medicine just completed its 25th anniversary. That's but a sliver of time out there. So that's among the reasons why I want to make sure and I debunk some of the myths and talk about some of the better practices for ourselves. Because if we've gone through medical training, we tend not to be the best sleepers, if I dare say that. So let's jump right into it. So, you know, I used to stay up quite late before I started looking at sleep, and I used to love watching the, the top 10 by Letterman, but since I go to sleep a little bit earlier, I just now have to try to put it in talks. So what are some of the top 10 reasons why we want to sleep? Number one, paying off sleep debt. Sleep debt is that concept that if you did not sleep well the night before, that you need more sleep. Now, it's not like money in a piggy bank. Three hours less last night if you were enjoying a show or got connected to a game or a roll of the dice, there would be the question, if you slept three hours less last night, would you need three more hours tonight? The concept is you will do recovery sleep. You will sleep deeper and potentially a little bit longer, and you'll pay off the majority of that sleep demise in the first night, but over three nights, definitely. But however, you're going to also find many of us are sleep deprived for a longer period of time. And we can talk about how challenging that is during the question and answer. Also, repleting the energy stores. It's so common that I'll talk to people that do great lifestyles during the daytime. But if we really want to be facilitating that next day, we need to be able to get that sleep and that restoration. All the way from documentation of mitochondrial health and in terms of all measures from glycolysis as well as fat oxidation, we do know sleep help, helps us here. Enhancing neuroplasticity. This is very exciting and we can find in many different ways that indeed we have had opportunities to talk about sleep leading to cognitive health. IN channels. It's, it's a remarkable field that touches every part of medicine we do. And without sleep, we see a lot more challenges here from musculoskeletal as well as neurological systems. Cooling the brain and the body cannot be um, overestimated during our days of physiology. We spoke about this. But indeed, sleep time is when many of us, from a whole body standpoint, are going to be cooler. And that physiologically gets forgotten in the medicine that we tend to practice. Next is optimizing our physiology from repair, growth, and overall optimization. And it really is that concept that we think of kids that don't get enough sleep are being challenged. From the Great World War and the Normandy studies, we know this classically. But we can also say that maybe you and I are not getting taller, but we definitely need that repair and growth in other ways. Improving our memory in terms of um, putting down the construct of that memory and then consolidating and integrating those memories. And I'll talk a little bit about that when we get into sleep stages. Also, smoothing our, soothing and smoothing out our emotions and our mental fatigue. One of the concepts that we don't speak enough about, in my very humble opinion, is emotional health. One of the opportunities to know is that during our sleep, we have an opportunity with our limbic system to connect with other parts of our overall cognition. And without that, we all know that we can be more irritable. But when we work with our patients and our clients, this is absolutely critical to give them the best emotional health. 
almost down there. Now we're talking about endogenous antioxidants. And without this, yes, we can talk about supplementation, but why not sleep first? And lastly, reducing inflammatory markers. This is relatively new in the literature. And what has been looked at, some of the antioxidants are very new. A great um, trial is about to come out of Boston, probably a couple years away from it. But we have enough to know that indeed it's the opportunity for us to speak about at a symposium like this. So here we're talking about optimal sleep. And then whenever I break it down with we're talking with the colleagues, talking with the patients or guests I work with, what I want us to know is that there's two easy ways to go at it. Number one, I often talk about quantity, and we're going to really focus on that, because that by far is the biggest conundrum that I'm seeing. We're not giving ourselves the time to sleep. But just in hand in hand with that, we need to talk about the quality notations. And again, insomnia is that which is the most famous, and we need to definitely understand that even better. Now, this might have been me, this might be some of us when we were thinking about sleep, college, and the different things. You know, come on, we went through medical training. But I will dare say that this was also told to me that you get to choose two. You can either get good, good grades, you can have a social life, or you can sleep. And unfortunately, now that I do a lot of executive health, I'm hearing this. Maybe not the good grades, but it's the productivity, it's that success quotient that they speak of. And let me dare say that if we're taken away from our sleep, all the rest of it is going to be compromised. Now, a little bit of myth busting that I like to put up here. How many people say, oh my gosh, I wish I could sleep like a baby. And therefore, one of the things I wish to ask us to understand, who are the best sleepers? Teenagers. Now, if any of you have had teenagers, if any of you have been around teenagers, who are they? They're the rock stars of sleep, and let's not deny that. And all of you, all of you had a teenage career. And when you think about your teenage career, what was the difference? What we do know as we become um, more or less looking at it, we do see that we need seven to nine hours of sleep. But how do we compare it to a teenager? Let me say it this way. A teenager is able to get into deeper sleep. Yikes, I'm making a point here. We get into deeper sleep, and they're less arousable, especially in the second half of the night. Now, any of you try to wake up a teenager before they're ready? Right? Fussy, good luck. It's not happening very well. And you and I, since our teenage career, are less deep, more arousable. However, however, you and I can suck up that arousability. And we get more or less applauded for that, right? Because those of us who complain do tend to get other notations that are unfavorable. So what do we know? You and I are less deep, we're more arousable, and we suck up that arousability. And a lot of times, this is one of the big challenges. Most people say, well, it's not that bad. I've learned to live with it. It really doesn't affect me. And I'm going to dare ask you to really focus on that seven to nine hours, because you're going to find 90% of us physiologically need this, 90%. So I dare say that that's a good notation to focus on in terms of seven to nine and helping us overall. A brief, brief history. Now I can go back to the Syrians talking about their dreams of meaning, giving them meanings from the gods above. But in the last hundred years, we've had much worse sleep. Ever since we've had the light bulb, we've slept less. What is that in simple terms? Think of it. We used to go down with the sun and we used to rise when it would come over the horizon as well. The number of hours of sleep that would give us is a lot different than today. Our great-grandparents slept an hour and a half, 90 minutes longer than you and I do today on average. Now, I have a lot of people say, big deal, we've learned to acclimate, we're genetically more enhanced. I think those are all um, our gargantuan statements. But I want us to remember, 90 minutes less of sleep, is that a big deal? When I talk about sleep cycles in a few moments, I dare say it is a huge deal. It's huge to miss, this, uh, miss out on this. Now, before we get into this, I want us to just take a little, at a little bit of what we call sleep staging. Now, this is that uh, matrix by which I look at when I do sleep consults, and we bring this up um, from a polysomnogram. And what we do see is that there's different stages of sleep. That which seems like an oxymoron is wake sleep. Stage one, two, three, and rapid eye movement. And I'm going to advance forward for a moment so we get a look here. Remember, we, just, we oscillate in and out throughout the night, and these pictorials are famous, but hardly do any of us exactly follow this. But we're going to talk about sleep cycles that more or less are constructed from the different stages. So what's the first stage? The first stage is something such as this. You close your eyes when you're intentionally and fully awake. And when you're closing your eyes, what is going on? There's something called alpha rhythms. And what that is, we find that when people, when do they intentionally close their eyes? When they pray when they meditate. The other day I was asking somebody a question and they closed their eyes and looked up at the sky and it made me realize this is something that we do a lot for cognitive performance. 
Now, stage one is very similar, but here's the thing. This is when you're ready for sleep and you're drowsy. So now your eyes are closed, you're peaceful, you're ready to fall asleep, and then all of a sudden somebody calls out your name and you're like, yep, I'm awake, mm-hmm. Yep, what happened? Yep, I wasn't sleeping. And I know one of you in here, like me, have gone through that. Now, was I asleep or was I awake? And the reason why I bring this up is you're going to see a lot more technologies talk about staging. And here's the hardest thing. You can take two sleep doctors looking at the same polyisomnogram and you're going to get three different answers, so to speak. This is the hardest thing to score because was I awake, was I asleep? And those transition times. This is usually only 1% or 2% of the night. So if you start seeing on those stages that more or less stage 1 is more than 2, 5%, you know there's something going on. Something is waking that person up throughout their night. Stage 2 is typical sleep. Now, typical sleep might not sound important, but this does a little bit of everything. But that which gets the biggest attention is stage 3 and rapid eye movement. Stage 3 is deep sleep, and it's just that. It's hard to be aroused. And rapid eye movement speaks to the fact that in dreams, our eyes move, but from chin down, we're relatively hypotonic, which is a good thing. Otherwise, we might be acting out our dreams, right? Chasing that bank robber, running from a wild animal. You and your bed partner would not prefer that at all during the night's rest. Now, what we do know, those dreams there are those that make up storylines. Those are legendary. Dreams can occur in any state, but those are flashes of light, pigments, any ideas of sound. Those things can happen throughout sleep but rapid eye movement is the storyline. But what I want us to look at here, when you look at an overnight sleep study, what I'm showing there on the bottom is this more or less seven to nine hours. If you look at the research studies, they say optimal sleep to be well rested, which means not falling asleep in the middle of a day, kind of like now, like you know, I usually have one person at the ranch fall asleep whenever I give this talk. So if it happens to you, you're following a great tradition. And also, hopefully, you're just awake for the good parts, whatever that may or may not mean. But I want us to look at 8 hours and 15 minutes, and therefore, artificially, think of the first half of the night and the second half of the night. The first half, say 4 hours, what do you see more of? And as I'm being subliminal and putting it in green, you see more of the deep sleep. And what do you see that occurs during deep sleep? This is an amazing time of restoration. This is when you are releasing growth hormone and testosterone. It's hysterical. I have men that come to my lectures and they're not interested. As soon as I say testosterone, they ask me to start over and they want to hear about this. What I will tell you classically is indeed that when I see somebody with crappy sleep, apnea, which I'll be talking about, I traditionally also see lower testosterone. And this is physiological, lower growth hormone, lower testosterone. So let me also say what occurs during that deep sleep is something pretty darn cool. It is the imprinting of some of our memories. And now I want to give you an analogy. It's as if you review the entire day that you just lived and you had a notepad in front of you. And in deep sleep, you are just going to be writing down the facts, like Sergeant Joe Friday, just the facts, and you're going to lay down and imprint thoughts. Now, what I want you to think about and hold those thoughts for a moment, let's go to the next side, the next four hours. And subliminally, I'm showing us an orange. What do we see more of in the second half of the night? Rapid eye movement. Now, what occurs during dreams is a great discussion. That was a fun research that was being done in the 70s, and it's making a comeback now. <coughs> but what I dare say for us during dream sleep is that we do something pretty neat. We imagine again that we have those stack of memories that we just imprinted, but now you're going to shuffle them. You're going to try to make sense of them into a storyline. And imagine now that you've gone to your file cabinet and you've opened up your brain. And now with that file cabinet, you're going to take those newly imprinted thoughts and figure out how you're going to put them with previous. So you're going to make connections with the new, with that of the old. What is that? That's problem solving. What is that? That's an aha moment. I thought those were just your little cutie statements of saying, oh, that's a good question. Let me sleep on it. Let me dream about it. And indeed, research is saying that without the dreams, we are not able to imprint and make some of those problem solving things optimally. Also during dream sleep is when you initiate the limbic system, a lot of the emotional healing and restoration occurs. As you can see, sleep is not a good idea, it's what we need to do. Now, here's the big take home. What are the things that are goofing us up? The first one, sleep apnea, snoring. Now let me say snoring is very poorly understood. Not all people have a noisy muffler or have an engine problem, and that's one of the things that we're still trying to figure out. But let me say that the small trials that have been done on snoring are given as correlations that there's more carotid intimal thickness. But when now they've gone on to do the following studies, it is controversial whether that leads to more strokes or not. 
And that's something that I'm very humbled to say that we just don't know at this point. But here is it. We know about apnea, right? It's that person snoring. And I'm not trying to make fun of anyone. Followed by or the gasp. Now that's the stuff we see on airplanes. That's the stuff that's legendary. That's that most obvious stuff, that pause, that snort. Now, every time I've had somebody come in and tell me that, or their bed partner, better yet, tells me that, I've always found apnea, as you can imagine. But if I hear somebody snoring and tired during the daytime, if I have somebody snoring and have a lot of cardiovascular risk, if I have somebody snoring with arrhythmias, with difficult to control blood pressure, it's unbelievable how much the correlation we're finding in the sleep studies that we do. Absolutely, that is now found in literature. And let me tell you, all of us practicing medicine see that classically. Next item on there that you see a lot of, if you ask for, and it's more common than any of us want to know, is restless legs, better known as periodic leg movements. Now, it's not just the legs, and it can be the upper extremities, and that's one of the ways we miss it. And you don't need to be kicking the cabaret, but let me give you some clinical pearls on how to pick this up. If you have somebody that needs to stretch out, they need to fan their toes, if they're rubbing their feet together, if they talk about creepy crawlies, if they talk about as an adolescent they had growing pains, what are we finding? All of that is likely related to a discussion of periodic leg movements. There is a huge opportunity here because this will have you more difficult to get to sleep. This is usually low dopamine in the brain. Dopamine for all of us is lower between 10 p.m. and 2 a.m. Classically, somebody with restless legs is a night owl, and then they can fall asleep finally. And we tend to give dopamine back to these folks here. So if you hear about a night owl, if you hear about this person having a difficulty getting to sleep, if you're hearing about any of these notations in their legs, ask them about it. I will tell you many times I'll bring it up to someone, they'll tell me absolutely not. I'll get a call back a week later saying, well, now that you mentioned it, I know it's there. Bruxism is teeth grinding, and let me give you another clinical pearl. A lot of times when you move the legs and more or less contract, you also tighten up throughout the body, and that's one of the times that we we'll also will brux. So if you know a teeth grinder and you look back at smooth teeth, ask about the legs. Pain and discomfort. Now, poor sleep will make you feel more achy. They did this to the, in those good old days when you could study medical students. They kept them up for three nights, and they put them in a clinic looking at fibromyalgia. You couldn't tell them apart. They're absolutely, the top um, rheumatologist had no clue because the pain was so severe. But we also know a lot of pain will make it more difficult to sleep. So what I'm going to ask you to, to think about is you got to address both of them. We're going to also talk about ca um, caffeine and alcohol in a moment. Both of them, I lose a lot of friends, and I have to discourage it to an extent um, with this. And room environment is very, very critical as well. Now let's take a look at what else goes on in terms of the disruptors. Depression and anxiety. Now this is also the chicken and the egg. But it would, again, if somebody is not sleeping well, it's going to be very difficult. And also those people with depression that are likely to remit getting back into another depression, those who do not sleep well are more likely than others to go back into depression. Huge opportunity. Hormonal balance, menopause, absolutely critical to discuss. Now, your logical bladder. Now, waking up one time per night, maybe two, is within normal limits. When somebody's waking up, one of the things that you'll find in the literature, and many of you have gone on to work this up looking for different reasons for this, you'll find only 30% that there's a urological reason for their wake-ups. 70% of the time, people wake up so fast that they don't realize that, it is, that the wake-up is triggering the sensation that now they realize they have a full bladder, but not the other way around. Neurological, it's unbelievable in terms of these that are cre creating a lot of the challenges. Traumatic brain injuries, strokes. Strokes are among the most devastating um, scenarios of sleep apnea that I've ever seen, but all just trouble sleeping altogether. Cardiovascular as well, one of the things that we found tremendously is arrhythmias throughout the night. If you have this question, make sure you write that on the request and ask them to specifically look for it because it's a small channel. It, is not, it has to be blown up pretty big for us to pick up on those, but you look, you find them. Autoimmune diseases, you name it, you'll see that the brain is more active. We have a cyclic alternating pattern. They just fluctuate, they float in and out of sleep throughout the night. It's quite humbling. All inflammatory conditions, especially those that are looking at inflammatory bowel, any inflammatory joint, you see just really fragmented sleep as well. Now, we, I've been bemoaning this thought that there's a connection, and let's show some thoughts to this. What I want us to take a look at is just a construct here, and this is my attempt to try to put it together. 
not getting enough sleep, sleep restriction, or not enough recovery sleep, can be intermixed with this not enough oxygen, this hypoxia and frequent arousals. Now, here's the thing. Not all people with apnea are going to desat, but they might have frequent arousals. And they also, therefore, are not going to get reparative sleep. I really want to drive home the point again here that it's just not apnea that's driving this inflammation discussion, but not enough sleep time, and also that fragmented sleep discussion is also hugely important to discuss here. Both of these patterns will more or less fl fluctuate right into stress and autonomic system activation. This is slickly um, shown in animal studies, and in limited human studies we see this classically as well. That person with apnea, that person with arousal, it is a huge adrenaline burst. From there, you're seeing the cortisol, the uh, catecholamines, blood pressure, blood sugar, all of that goes up. And the great studies they've done, you'll see that more or less uh, morning blood sugars, morning cholesterol, morning C-reactor protein, you name it all, all of that is higher right after a poor night of sleep or after just um, a night of full apnea. Therefore, we see the leukocytes, the inflammatory cytokines, the C-reactor protein, as I mentioned, and oxidative stress notations also being elevated, and therefore are pro-inflammatory and endothelial. It is absolutely humbling how much overlap we, we can find in this field, and it's only recently being looked at and more in animal studies than in human studies, but they are coming in the next few years. And therefore, as you have cardiovascular morbidities, that's getting back, and those with heart disease are classically plagued with not having as good sleep at night. And this just feeds this train and builds and builds upon it. So distorted sleep can be looked at in terms of inflammation, the metabolic syndrome, vascular and hormonal challenges, which leads into what you and I are seeing, that blood pressure, that obesity, that diabetes, and the lipids as we spoke, speak of. And therefore, why are we seeing such high correlations? Well, the, just these mechanisms might be feeding into it. That coronary disease and cardiovascular disease. If we're talking about strokes, which are very highly correlated in terms of dementia as well as death, with sudden cardiac death, dementia, mild cognitive impairment, all of these things are more or less more reported in the last decade. And now a little bit of just constructs of us getting a better idea of just the connections between obstructive sleep apnea. What you we're seeing there at the top is that in terms of this study um, done by Minaguchi, that all of these folks had a high BMI. And you take a look at it and you see from left to right, you go from an apnea hypopnea index, the number of times per hour that they're not breathing or shallow breathing. And as you build up, take a look what happens. Oxygen dips on the next line as you draw your eyes across to the right. And then as you keep looking, the C-reactor protein takes a significant increase. IL-6 and IL-18 also takes a significant increase when going across there. So huge opportunities for us to be looking at this connection. We also see that there's a U-shaped curve when you talk about just something simple, something easy for us to look at. How much sleep are you getting? A U-shaped impact. Short duration, less than five hours, more than nine hours. And remember, just because you're seeing more sleep doesn't mean it's good sleep. Some people need more time in bed just to be able to get a few of those sleep cycles in. And that's one of the things that doesn't get understood by our population of uh, patients. There was a stronger correlation in women than in men, and there's still not any great answers of understanding that at this time. Also, the adipokines, what we see here was that there was an increase in leptin and visafatin. Leptin, of course, being that which um, can talk about when it's higher, you have leptin resistance. Obviously, um, leptin helps us more toward the lean discussion in terms of weight management. Visafatin, which is one of the newer markers, is talking about the inhibition of the insulin receptor. Now, I was just at the Obesity Society yesterday and the day before, and I was asking them as to what levels of these are they finding clinically significant. And to my dismay, I could not get, a, get us a final answer that I was hoping to report at this time. What I wish to also share with you is less REM was also leading to an increase in these markers as well. So what we're finding classically is not enough sleep and not enough REM is a huge challenge to that of being hungrier. And absolutely, the stressed out person, the sleepy person is the hungrier person. And those pathways are more and more un understood and becoming robust. Blood sugar. What do we know? That we've talked about insulin resistance leading to age products. We also know that high caloric intake and saturated fat. But oxidative injury from sleep apnea in separate trials have been able to show this when they've been able to control for the other two factors. So yet maybe a third um, co um, covariable in this thought. Hypertension, this has been discussed earlier and I'm so glad and this is so fascinating to think that you and I normally dip our blood pressure at nighttime and those people with apnea or disrupted sleep do not. 
So sleep-related breathing disorders, which mainly is apnea of any type, promotes this non-dipping. And even mild apnea is associated with the risk of developing hypertension in four years with uh, an observed odds ratio of 1.42. But then look what happens when you get into moderate and severe apnea. That skyrockets to an odds ratio of 2.9, much more significant. What do we know that we've talked about syndrome X, the metabolic syndrome, and this author here had a real fun job putting together this concept. What happened if there's a syndrome Z, right? Us in sleep medicine, we see the whole world as sleep or not sleep. And what do we talk, uh, we can talk about here is that if you're talking about sleep disturbance here and you're talking about a model fit and any of you those who went through public health school like me and this kept you up late at night trying to create these models. And what do you find is that with sleep disturbance, it had a greater fit as compared to insulin resistance, hypertension, and dyslipidemia. None of us are going to discount how important those are. The only factor that was more important was obesity itself when it was there. And obviously, again, you don't need all of these factors to make it metabolic syndrome. Sympathetic surges are also related to this. Sleep losses are related to these CNS up re regulations of sympathetic um, um, upcharge, uh, discharge, and to a lesser extent through the HPA access. And something that is getting more and more literature in terms of the basic science is that those sympathetic discharges are leading to a challenge with um, antiviral um, opportunities of regulating wellness. Also, what we find is short and long duration promotes the concept of pneumonia. And what we are finding is not enough sleep and longer sleep. But also, if you ask somebody how well they slept last night, that is also highly correlated there with the relative risk of one and a half. Short sleep duration and immunity. Those who slept less than six hours, they did not have a sufficient response in all cases with hepatitis B vaccination and the influenza. A huge opportunity for us to think about the infection connection with that of sleep and a whole inflammatory cascade there. Now, also, long and short durations, a U-shaped curve with all cause mortality. We're seeing short duration of sleep, but here, long duration as well. A long duration is absolutely more hazardous. It's less common, but it's more hazardous. Again, probably that these people are so exhausted that they need to be in bed that much longer. Also, insomnia. Now, take a look at this one. The prevalence is pretty high, one out of five people, 21%. The adjusted odds ratio of looking at this is 2.2 in terms of these medical disorders. And because of the sake of time, I'm just going to just let you look at that. Do see that it's almost everything that I see on a daily basis. It's unbelievable to think how much insomnia and potentially through this inflammatory pathway. Now, who is sleepy? 21% of the U.S. adults think that they're sleepy. 75% when more or less taking a look at just whole executive health panels will indeed have a sleep problem. Less than half of people will talk about it. There's only 3,000 people doing sleep medicine right now. and let you know there's about 15,000 doing cardiology. So all of us need to know more about this sleep. The consequences of this, obviously you don't want to be this person. What do we do know? We've normalized this. It's not normal for the following. It's not normal, my friends, to fall asleep in the afternoon especially when you're reading. It's not normal to drift off at afternoon meetings, even if it's a boring meeting. And I get, people look at me all the time, a boring book, a boring meeting, I'm supposed to be awake? Uh-huh, yes. If you've got enough rest, you will stay awake even through something that is so awful. <laughs> Sleeping on airplanes. Now, I work over at Canyon Ranch in Tucson. Everybody comes on a plane, they look at me like, dude, it's the best sleep of all time. You've got to be kidding me. Now, it's a big um, idea to think about it this way. If you're like me, you like to get on the plane a little bit early. Why? A little bit late, you're going to miss. And if you've done that once, it's absolutely an adrenaline rush, and that's no good. So I usually get in quite a bit early. I'll sit there. I've gone through that magazine in the front pocket. As long as I'm not telling my life story to the next guy or I'm not hearing their life story, not much going on. There's a big white noise machine where I have to be fastened in and I can't frolic up and down. It's a boring time, and you're a captive audience for a number of hours. And we find a lot of ways that we typically just keep ourselves awake. Falling asleep or watching TV in the early evenings. Now, this is not at nighttime, and it's a discussion point whether you should use the TV or not. If you have sleep problems, it's better to avoid it for, as a, a clinical experience for yourself. It's not normal to sleep when you're a passenger in a car. And I have you know, couples that come in, and they'll be elbowing each other, saying, see, I told you so. And it's not normal, and this one freaks out a lot of people, to drift off while waiting at red lights or at stop signs. My friends, this is much more common than any of us want to know. Every year, there's more fatalities related to sleepiness than alcohol, and that's not made up. That's every year for the last 13 years. This is a huge opportunity and a must. 
Now, this is a real neat piece of data here. This is 14 days of restricting people in, t in uh, one of four groups. No time in bed, four hours in bed, six hours in bed, and eight hours for bed. And they did it over 14 days. And what they did is performance vigilant testing. They put them in front of a screen and they flashed lights. Within one second, they had to hit the button. If they hit it wrong, it was a mistake. If they did it too late, that was a problem. Look there, at, with the person getting eight hours of sleep, no more than two mistakes. Now, if you're like me, you're like, well, it seems like they made more mistakes there at the very end. Well, my friends who do this research saying, well, look, buddy, if you stared at a screen for two weeks and had to click a button, you might get a little bit lazy at the end. And that's what we see. But no more than two mistakes is very good. But let's look over at the far left, those little red dots. Take a look. One night of no sleep, eight mistakes. Next night of no sleep, 13 mistakes. Another night of no sleep, thankfully then we let them go to sleep, but they made 15 mistakes. Now look at the yellow. This is a person getting four hours of bedtime. What do you see? That they increase, increase, but let's take a closer look. After 14 days, what do you see? As many mistakes as if you've been up for three nights. This happens slower. This, therefore, is not as brutal. We don't get smacked around and make this very obvious. But many people won't think that they are that bad off as compared to somebody who's been up for three nights. Now, many people say, look, Parm, I get more than four hours. I probably get six. Look there at six. After a 14-day span, you're making as many mistakes as somebody's been up for a day and a half. Now, many people like say, look, it's not 14 days. It's Monday through Friday that I really have to hit the ground and pound the pavement. And then thereafter, you know, I get my rest. And what I'll ask you to know is look at five and six days there. And what I'm going to let you know, that's an assumption that you hit the reset button over the weekend. Well, let me give you this. Genetically, some of you are better recovery sleepers than others. And we're also making the assumption that you have no disordered sleep, and therefore you can do that full recovery. The last point, and this is a point that annoyed me for the longest time, and it still does to a good extent, is when you do the sleepiness scales between the four-hour and the six-hour group, what do you find? The sleepiness scale reports are almost identical. In other words, a four-hour sleeper thinks that they're as sleepy as a six-hour or vice versa. I have people say, no, 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 I would know the difference. The literature after literature after literature keeps saying we don't know the difference. Now, this is where I'm going to lose a few friends, especially when you're in Vegas, talking about sleep, and now I'm going to talk about alcohol. Here is the concept. One drink leads you to be one hour more relaxed, and relaxed doesn't just mean relaxed, it also means muscle relaxation. Not just the beach muscles, but also those around your neck. So therefore, you're going to have a tendency to snore more, and you're going to have worsening of any baseline apnea that you have. So therefore, one hour after drinking, you're going to have more of that muscle relaxation. Then the next hour, you're going to be more aroused. So you're going to have two hours of potentially grumped up sleep. Now, you have to multiply this. If you throw back two cocktails before bedtime, you would need four hours of this to go through your body, and you keep multiplying this. I have my guests and my patients say, gosh, I'm going to start drinking in the morning, it seems like. It's not that which I'm encouraging. Um, please know I'm not encouraging that. Now, um, caffeine, what do you know? Now, this doesn't affect everybody equally. We know from genetic studies, looking at genes like COMT, some of us will do better than others. But for many people, it takes seven hours for your caffeine to go down by 50%. So an 8 a.m. cup of java is a half a cup at 3 p.m., and at 10 p.m., it's a quarter cup. And it might not bother some of us, but think if you do that afternoon pick-me-up, you've hit the reset button on this. Now, what I'm going to also say, some of you can say, ha-ha, I can take that espresso and go right to bed. Some of you say, I chew on espresso beans with chocolate, and I'm going to sleep immediately. What that does, it blocks a, a chemical called adenosine. And adenosine is the most critical chemical out there to help induce deep sleep. So even though you can get to sleep, you're not getting that deep stuff. You're not getting that opportunity for reparative stuff. My man, my woman, we're not getting our testosterone or our growth hormone. Potentially, that's an opportunity to cut back on the late hours of that. Now, just finishing up here, what do we want to do? And I want us to all think about this and just, you know, you do this, but it's always good to review. I ask us one hour before bedtime to have a ritual and to start to ramp down. Too many of us are on our, our computers, our tablets, in front of the TV. Too many lights are in front of us. I want us to unplug. Why? Light is activating to the brain. From the optic nerve to the reticular activating system, it has been said as the fastest neurological pathway in the body. Also, indeed, blue light is more stimulating, and almost all those screens have a significant blue hue to them. You're finding new screens that can turn it down. What you also want to consider is that you would want to dim the lights around you. Consider aromatherapy. There is literature and research on this. Warm showers help. Why? Because when you come out of them, you're slightly cool. 
Coolness induces a lot of the chemicals that will give you closer to deep sleep and obviously will help initiate a good sleep pattern. Getting to sleep is always going to be a rolling、um, discussion, but here's one thing you can control. You can't will yourself to fall asleep, but you can will yourself to wake up. So when you're working with yourself or any one of your loved ones or your patients, demand them to have a set wake up time. Again, it's not always fun and easy, but it's critically important. You go to bed when you're tired, not before. But let me also say this if after 20 minutes you're still awake, get out of bed. It doesn't matter if you're trying to get asleep or if you woke up in the middle. What do people typically most, most commonly want to do when they wake up? They'll go check their internet, their email. They'll turn on the TV. They've just activated the reticular activating system. It's going to be harder to get back to sleep. So, among the things is creating a ritual upfront of what they're going to do. Maybe a, a nice chair, maybe some,、uh, to do some reading with a soft light, some yoga posture, some stretching, a lot of different ways to look at this, really helping them create a ritual. Now, I'm just going to say that I wish I could just do this, right? Take out my prescription pad, write down, say, hey, good, a good night's sleep, thank you very much, right? Like, it's really helpful, like my weight management work, just eat less and move more. Well, gee, thanks, well, that's really helpful. What I'm going to just close here with saying is that when we talk about sleep, we're talking about inflammation. When we talk about sleep, we've got to dig. Not all people are going to be the stereotype. I didn't get into the details of apnea, but I'll tell you more and more people I'm finding with apnea are not the big neck, are not those with、uh, apple shaped、um, uh, obesity. They are the people that are frankly like this audience here, that is overall in very good shape and lean, but the architecture from the nose all the way down to the throat. Too many of us minimize insomnia, no more. Insomnia is a health risk, and we need to now make movements in that because by doing this work on sleep, we're going to actually help what we're doing here. I look forward to those opportunities for us to be able to measure these things、um, before and after、uh, in terms of inflammation because I do say that there is a connection. Thank you guys, and I wish you a good night's rest.